So as we said in the previous video that we're going to look at another example, and it's the example of a simple pendulum. And we're going to actually show that this is a little bit of a unique system in, in it, and we'll point out some stuff as we go along. So hopefully you've played with a pendulum before, and hopefully you've come up with some relationships that you can see, like if you change the length of a pendulum, the longer the pendulum, the longer it takes for it to complete a period, um, and that the period, if you were to double or quadruple the length of a pendulum, that your uh, that the pendulum will only get double the length of the period. So twice as long of a pendulum will not get you twice as long of an oscillation. But these are all stuff that we'll be able to see mathematically later on. So what is a pendulum? Well, a pendulum is nothing more than the little thing that slides side to side on a grandfather clock or a cuckoo clock or it's a giant bowling ball attached to a ceiling by some string, or just, you know, some mass at the end of a string that oscillates back and forth. And hopefully you won't watch this too carefully, otherwise you'll start to get really tired and we'll be able to make you cluck like a chicken after you get hypnotized. But we're doing physics, we're not doing hypnotism. So let's see what the system looks like. Well, if we look at this system, well, we're going to notice that this thing is rotating. It's not actually translating. We're rotating around a pivot point up here. So we're not dealing with Newton's second law for translation. We're dealing with rotation. So we'll start using torque. So let's start drawing a diagram again. Three by a diagram for this guy has this ball at its maximum um, part over here, has a mass um, that will give us a weight force pointing down. It also has a tension force pointing in that direction. So Newton's second law for rotation says that the net torque is going to be equal to I alpha, the moment of inertia, times alpha. So we need to know the torque. We also need to know the moment of inertia, and we can hopefully then figure out some, some stuff about this. Well, the moment of inertia, if we look over here, this is a mass of m at some distance of L. So I'm going to call this distance, the, the length of the string from the point it rotates around to the center of the, the block, I could call that distance L. So if I look at my equation, I sum up every mass, one mass, it has some radius, and I'll see that this mass is at some radius squared. And that's the moment of inertia for this guy rotating around this point. So we're good. Now let's move on to the torque. Well, for the torque, we're going to need an extra little angle in here. So I have the distance. My distance vector points from the axis of rotation up here down to where the force attaches. And my force is at the center of the ball. So my distance, my force times my distance times my sine of my angle. And it's the cross product we can look. We can find out what direction this is going in. So in my setup here, I have a negative value because my torque is going into the page. So when we combine everything, sum of the torques minus mgl sine theta equals i ml squared times alpha. We get the alpha back in here and we get this wonderful equation. And we notice that there's mass canceling on each side. And we're going to take a moment and actually just think about what happened right there. We just canceled mass from both sides of this equation. We used it to solve the problem but it now is no longer in this equation. So anything that this equation is based off of can't be mass dependent. So if you've ever played with a pendulum, the length of the pendulum matters. The mass of the pendulum, how heavy you make this little mass that's swinging back and forth, won't matter for the pendulum. It's kind of a cool little effect. Well, we can make another simplification, and that's the L. One of the Ls will drop out, but we're still left with an L. So the length probably is going to matter. Also, g is still in there, so g is probably going to matter on there. And we're left with this equation, minus g sine theta is equal to L alpha. Okay, great. Same equation, minus g sine theta equals L alpha. Well, we do a little arranging, rearranging, and we get alpha is equal to minus some constant over another constant, you know, combination of constants, times sine of theta. All right we hit a snag here. This is not what we want. We know that theta and alpha are in that two derivative relationship that we want. We got that minus sign, but we have the sine. It's the sine of theta. We don't have theta. We want theta, but we don't quite have it. 
So it looks very similar to this equation, a minus omega squared. If we say L over G is equal to omega squared, but we don't have x. We have sine of x, sine of theta in this case. So physicists do things every so often. As long as we can justify what we're doing, we can get away with a lot of stuff. So we're going to cheat a little bit. And what we're going to cheat is we're going to say sine of theta is equal to theta. It's approximately equal to theta. This is known as the small angle approximation. Okay, And the reason why we call it small angle approximation is this actually is a pretty good approximation as long as the angle is small. If theta is measured in radians, the sine of that angle is about the same. And find, uh, find Excel, put a bunch of values in for theta, and you'll see that you know, if you're 10 degrees or less, you know, less than about 0.1 radians or so, that this is actually a pretty good approximation. So make this approximation, put everything back together, and we're back at alpha minus some constants e uh, times theta. This is this equation again. So we get out that if we can use all the same equations again that we have as long as g over l is equal to omega squared. So we get done with everything. We see that, again, we're back to the harmonic oscillator. We do have that small angle approximation. So if we do have a large angle, we are violating that. We have to reassess what's going on. But for small angles, we should have harmonic motion. The cosines, the sines, all that stuff should be applicable for the things that we've seen before. So here's another system we saw, we've seen. It has the same general form as a spring mass system, same thing as the planet revolving around a sun or a moon revolving around a planet type of thing. They all give us the same general equation, so we can use the same general approach for all of these.